So now that we've forged the knife close to shape, so we forge it to shape, we forge it in our geometry, we forge it in our distal taper, we forge it in our bevels, we forge it in our handle. You see I have the handle laid out. I'm gonna grind into it a little bit right here for just clearance for a larger hand. So, but this is like the biggest portion that we're grinding. But even the distal taper is forged in here. So today what we're gonna do is we're going to prep this for heat treat. And then we're gonna heat treat the blade and temper it. And uh, this is a pretty crucial part in, in understanding how to put handle material onto something that transitions into a brute to forge. So, and I think that that's something that I struggled with early on. And I think a lot of people struggle with it is how do you keep the brute to forge, but then correctly put a handle on there that's flat and has no like reveals of like, you know, unflat surface. And you don't want to put handle material on there if it's not flat and then you just kind of clamp it and bend it to it because that will eventually pop. So we're going to show you how to prep your knife. So that's step two. <laughs> you fucking videoing me and I got this fucking 40 years old and I got a zit on my forehead. What the fuck, bro? <laughs> So with this process, when you're, when you're doing stock removal of a blade and you're cutting it on a 90 degree angle, you're gonna really want to, you're gonna really wanna use an old belt for this because when you're at a 90 degree angle and you're cutting hard, it's got a, almost a square edge and it breaks all the teeth off of your belt. So. That's definitely not a time you want to use a fresh belt. So this is an old used uh, 60 grit. And I'm gonna stock removal this handle out. Okay. So we see that we got like it all measured out roughly of what we want. So I'm going to grind this profile first and then, and then we'll drill our holes to make sure we're in the right spot while it's still relatively flat. And then from there, I'll show you what to do next.
Better watch out. Dane's gonna put a link in the bio for where you can buy mad sunglasses with safety glasses. Click on the link. Let me make some money. <laughs> Click the link in the book and We got a we got a different link in the bio, huh? Unlike most links in the bio you see. Uh. <laughs> uh, you go on Instagram, link in the bio. Oh, that. Got some wholesome link in the bio, bro. Link in the bio. What do you do for work? I'm a content creator. <laughs> I don't know anybody that does that. Okay, so now we're gonna, so now we got some, some space and we can always go a little bit more as we're going, but it feels good. Uh, I'm gonna drill this, uh, pre-drill this handle now because the steel is annealed and it's soft, you won't be able to drill it once you harden it. So that's why it's so important to uh, do all this work now before you harden it, uh, because it gets a lot harder and a little bit more difficult as the, uh, after the heat treat. sometimes when you're drilling and you hear that sound uh, a lot of like ADCRV and a lot of like a lot of blades build up a lot of carbide and so you sometimes you have to drill it and like I don't really want to go through that uh, cycling process so we're just going to drill it with a pure carbide drill bit uh, pure carbide drill bits um, are a great tool they are delicate and really fragile so you have to be careful it's like pretty much like drilling steel with a piece of glass um, it will definitely cut hardened steel 
but it's actually pretty, you know, pretty ch challenging to use. You don't want want it to uh, twist. Because it will just shatter, you know what I mean? This drill bit you can buy on Amazon with the link in the bio to help my videographer out make his 20 bucks for the month. He might be able to buy half a sandwich in Hawaii with 20 bucks. <laughs> he may be able to take a girl out and get a drink for himself. <laughs> 20 bucks, boo. Well, you're not thirsty. No, no, you're good. I'm good. <laughs> Uh, one Red Bull vodka and one water for me. As you can see, we're extremely precise here. Got a two by four full of holes and I'm holding it with my hand. <laughs> I mean, that, there's one thing that when I was like working with Jason Knight, he's just like, you know, with this shape handle and uh, you know, with this shape handle and doing six pin like, and I, I, I only do six pin like this, or I do Corby bolts and six pin is like really on there and, and I believe in it. But when you have six pins, like to try and find, actually find center or like some sort of like even, you know, even proportion to something like this, it, it, there's nothing that's really even or, so Jason always says like, just make it pleasing to the eye, you know what I mean? And that's kind of what we're doing. Um, because there's no real rhyme or reason in why things are set up like this, you know? Yeah. Okay, so we got our holes drilled, six pins. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to hollow this thing out so that one, there's two reasons for hollow grinding this section out. One, it gives, if you were to put, just put scales on here like this, like this, and you squeeze it, there's no room for the glue. So you basically squeeze all the glue out. And so we're gonna hollow grind a pocket in here so that there's a good amount of glue that can still stay under there when it's flush. The other reason for hollow grinding it out and having a distal tapered handle is so that it's lighter in the handle, you know, so it helps you balance the knife out that way. And then the third reason for hollow grinding out this area is it leaves less amount of contact space to flatten. 
because you're hollowing out to get all of this dead flat is difficult to just get the outer edge of it flat a lot easier so there's three advantages to hollow grinding out a handle gi joe now you know right knowing's half the battle <laughs> And I suck at hollow grinding a fuller, so this is good practice, right? not really trying to make something pretty i'm trying to make something about as you know hollowed out as i can go so you know you can go in there and just i'll get out now
Now we're gonna grind in the handle and start flattening it out. So now we're going to use this um, this uh, nine inch flat disc grinder and we're going to just lightly put some contact cement on here, let it dry. I was watching a mare braid for their hyper disc put on a put on a um, a piece of sandpaper and they didn't file like the abrasive off like what I just did and I said boy none of you motherfuckers skated did you like this is how you put a skateboard deck on yeah yeah, I was like, well, no skateboarders there. And there was so many people that liked that comment. They're like thinking the same thing. Like, you know, so you bust off all the, uh, you bust off all the abrasives and all you're left is cutting a piece of paper, you know, you know, and it's just a cleaner, cleaner transition. Even though I'm using the world's dull, look at his, look at his razor blade, bro. Good lord. Okay. I've had this um, um this uh uh. AMK disc grinder for years, dude. I love it. Okay. So now we're going to grind this dead flat. And we're going to try and transition this into the Brute Forge. do the other side So basically we have our uh, our handle all set to go. So you just have to make sure you don't bend it while you're heat treating it. 
But, uh, and we're forged so thin that we can go straight to heat treat. Um, you know, it's thin here, thick here. Get your forged distal. And so, um, but this is the work that you want to get done. You don't want to be trying to drill it after it's hardened and then you have to try and soften it. So the drilling's done. I did an awful job at hollow grinding. <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, this doesn't matter. Sometimes I kill it and sometimes I don't, I don't know, whatever. You're just trying to hog this material out just so that you have a glue pocket. And then when it comes to like this side, I'll hollow the wood side out so that there's a, um, there's a pocket there for, uh, for glue. And so uh, let's heat treat it. So if you, if when I, heat treating is a very crazy thing. Like if you have, there's a lot of people that do not believe in heat treating in a kiln. And I, I you know, I'll, oh, hold on. My glove. There's a lot of people that don't believe in heat treating in a kiln because it's uh, not very accurate. And so when you're heat treating based on color, right? Uh, color is a huge, and what I mean by color is people are like, oh, I pull it out on between red and orange and then I quench it. That, that's a huge range of temperature, you know? And I did it by eye for years. And, and um, but that's not the smartest and best way to do to it's cool that i still can go back and do that by eye but it's not when you're trying to create a product that people are spending a lot of money with you want to use the you know the best advancements that you can so this is just a simple uh thermometer or whatever and uh and so this is how i track the heat and you notice that like i don't have a when i i tell people not to to heat treat a knife with a top firing uh, forge because it's just directly hitting the blade. So if you can imagine as the forge is blowing this massive flame, it hits your tip first. And let's say now you have two, right? So it hits your tip first, then your tips again, and then it comes tip, tip, right? So it's just smoking the tip off your knife. So you always, like if you have a top firing forge, what you wanna do is go around the direct flame and then pull it back and drag it out and then quickly come out at the tip, right? So you wanna go past it. I mean, and that's a lot of work. And when I see people with top firing forges and they just got the shit in there and they're not moving it around and feeding it in there, you, your, your grain structure on your tip is gonna be so enlarged and it's gonna be so much more hotter. Now, the reason why I heat treat out of this kiln is because this kiln is probably the most uh, I mean, this forge, this forge, because this forge is, shoots in a circle. So it's a vortex style forge. And Peter Schwartzberg built this forge for me. And it's probably one of the most accurate forges that I've ever come across. And so that's why I, I like to heat treat knives with fire. Like I think that it gives it life. Like, and there's nothing wrong with, with heat treating a knife out of a kiln. Like I have a kiln. You know, I have two kilns, you know, but I'm off grid, so I have to run a generator to run this, and it's $15 an hour to run it, and it takes, this thing takes like about two hours to get up to temp. So I'm like, eh, I just do it from the forge. Been doing it for a long time. Hold on, let me change these tongs. These tongs suck. 
Find a different tong 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 Any mini, mini mo. I don't know. I bought a like I bought all of these tongs in one shot, and then the rest of them I made or I had somebody else make, and then I was like, I need to be a big boy and actually just buy some. It's like I never heat treated one of these before, bro. Huh? On today's video. So I have the, my back burner turned off and we're just running off this single burner right here. And what it does is it creates a very even heat. Like I've put temperature gauges and all this thing and the heat is, there's like so much kale wool in here. It's a very like even heat. Basically, you can see I have the this thermometer. What, what is this thing called? A pr it's called something. It's like a I don't fucking know, whatever. Um, but you can see its color. So like, once the blade becomes the same color as the tip of the uh, what is this thing called? It's called a pr Google. Hey, Google it. It's called a parameter or pr. I bought it on fucking Amazon. <laughs> it's Whatever. It's the thing that measures the degrees inside my forge. I wish, that's when I wish um, Peter Schwartzberg was here. He knows like everything. I just do it. <laughs> I don't know what half of this is called. Okay, so I got this little like piece of rebar preheated because what we do is like I'll put it in the quenching oil and like preheat it because we're trying to shoot for roughly around 120 degrees. You don't want it just cool or room temperature like it's kind of early in the morning so the temperature will be down so it'll be good with preheat it. So let's see what temperature this oil is at. Uh, 102 degrees. Which is a lot better than what it would be, what it started out as. It was 68 degrees, and now we're at over 100, and see now it's about 110 climbing. So I kind of find that a piece of just rebar kind of gets it to where it needs to be.
I've never, I, I got this steel from, uh, from, um, Alpha Knife Supply, and they wanted me to try it. It's, uh, I don't even remember what the, what it's called. It's, uh, I had to look it up on their site. <laughs> And it, on the, what's cool about their site is that they have like all the heat treats. Oh, it's 2063. And it's kind of like their version of like a Japanese Hitachi steel. Um, so on the bottom of their website, on each steel, it has all like everything that what's inside the steel, like what's its toughness, its edge retention, its alloy you know composition table and so it has the austenizing process on here which they're recommending 1475 which is actually a pretty low uh, temperature heat treat which is pretty cool you know what I mean so what we're gonna be doing is running it to a little bit over 1475 and then we're gonna shut it off let it so that it never comes above 1475 i mean you know within you know 25 degrees of the its optimal quenching temperature and so we just keep it regulated it's almost like if it's in a kiln and you're programming it to like turn on and turn off and turn on and just do it manually um and i mean this comes to temp in you know seven minutes versus some of the other stuff takes a little bit longer it's it's great i use it sometimes but for the process of today we're on film time so we're gonna just do it by the forge And this is where this thermometer takes a lot of the guessing out, you know, because when you're going by visually by color, um, it could be every like just the different times of the day can change the coloring. And that's why I like I have this shadow box in here so that you can put the knife all the way in here to see like the coloring. If you are doing it by eye, I'm not doing it by eye. This takes all the guessing. So you don't have to shut the lights off. You don't have to be in the in the in the middle of the day or, or at night, like l let the thermometer do its, uh, its own, its job, you know? Dane's not even gonna edit this part out, like fast forward, he's just gonna run it this whole time. Yeah, to get more hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, cut the f the nah, bro, just leave him. <laughs> We're calling it a vlog style. <laughs> No, if you want this free information, you want it for free, you got to just deal with it, bro. Hit that 10 second. Uh, what is Neil doing? H hurry up. Uh, oh, did he talk? Okay, go back. That was nonsense. Okay, let's <laughs> go. Tutorials with Neil T. Kamimura. <laughs> How to make something sharp and pointy. No, the, you know how good Dane is at a, as a videographer? People think I'm like really tall. They're like, that's how good of a camera guy he is. And then they meet me in real life. They're like, wow, you're really short. I'm like, duh, bro, what do you think? I, but his camera angles, all the low angles and all the, like, oh, the guy's huge. I'm not, no. <laughs> That's, you know, a good camera guy. Oh, I know. People always come in the shop and say two things. Oh, it's a lot smaller than I thought, and you're a lot shorter than I thought. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we basically have this for about 10 minutes in here. Um, you know, after we were done forging, I normalized it. Um, probably should have showed that process, but basically normalizing is just bringing it up to temp a certain temperature, letting it cool, bringing it up to temp, and you cycle it about three times. And what that does is it reduces the grain structure. And and what you're trying to do is this. And, and the thing that I tell people to do is if you're a beginning knife maker, like take a knife, harden it, and snap it, and look inside the knife. It doesn't have to be a finished knife, but then you can really examine the grain structure. And the grain structure should look like super fine powdered steel. And that's how you know that you reduce the molecules inside of the steel to like its best performance, right? So you can buy the fanciest steels in the world and if you don't know how to heat treat them, they're garbage, right? Grain structure's all blown up, you know? And, and what you have to think about it is just like, basically it's just a bunch of molecules touching each other. So the more molecules you have touching each other and the finer the grain structure is, the tougher the steel is. If you enlarge all of them and then there's just less things touching and it's easier to break and so even if you buy the finest steels take the time to learn how to 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 heat treat them because if not you're just wasting your time you know what i mean and you're not getting the performance it's almost like buying a a filet and then cooking it to death or something you know what i mean like you you want to be able to optimize your steel's performance and that's why i tell people don't like force your knife maker to work with steel he's not comfortable with because because what happens is they just don't know how to use that steel if somebody uses like even if it's 1070 which is not a very sought after steel but they know how to optimize it it's going to be the best knife of your life you know what i mean because that person knows how to use that steel So when you're going in for the quench, which we're going to do pretty soon, you're going to want to go all the way in, not halfway in, not slowly in. You want to go all the way in. Then you're going to want to, you're going to want to pull it up and down and move it back and forth because you're trying to prevent a vapor jacket, you know, because what happening is boy, it boils and air, air pocket is developing around the blade and then it stops it from cooling. And what you're trying to do is cool it as quickly and as smoothly as possible so it can transform from austenite to martensite through that, this 1475 to 900, 600, that's when it's building. You know what I mean? So the quicker and the smoother that you can get it there, the better the blade's hardness will be. You know what I mean? And you'll get a fully hard blade versus when people quench it really quick then pull it out and it's all on fucking fire like and they're like cool take my photo like all you're doing is tempering your knife you know you quenched it it didn't get under that spot to maximize the austenite to martensite and then you leave it on fire that fire is way over the tempering temperature you know what i mean and so you're just undoing everything that you did so if your knife is on fire put it back in bro like maximize it like you really want a non-dramatic quench you don't want a big flame ball and shit and things happening what you want is to go in it may catch a little bit on fire while it's in there and it come come down but you do not want to be pulling it out quickly you want it to drop under that temperature But like Forge and Fire, they did that all the time. You know, they got the pictures of the knives on fire with them quenching it. And the reason is not necessarily that the knife makers don't know what they're doing, but they don't allow you to bring a temperature, a gauge or a kiln. They want you to do it by eye through a double burn burner forge. That's just, they won't let you adjust the forge. So that thing's running at a million degrees, right? And so, and you're in studio lighting. So what you think looks orange in studio lighting is probably two, 300 degrees hotter than what you think it is in a normally dark shop, you know? And so that's why you see so much flame balls and knives break in it is because of that reason. Okay, you ready? Get ready to do this.
Oof. All for the shot, huh? Breed in all that shit. And a good way to look at it is if it's not boiling around it, it's a good time to take it out. Woo! Yeah. There you go. That's how to do it. You don't want to harden a blade and then leave it overnight. Like the best optimal time to uh, temper a blade after quenching is immediately after. So if I can't run a temper cycle on it, I won't harden the knife. Until I can actually, it can go just straight in, you know? And we want to wash that oil off so as it's baking in the oven, you know. So I got the kiln on. We're going to run it for two cycles for two hours and that's it. On to the next. When it's done, we'll show you how to flatten it again and then uh, like final flatten it, finish grind it, hand sand it, etch it, patina it, put some handles on it, sharpen it, do the whole shebang.